Today on Know the Truth, Philip DeCourcy continues a lesson on spiritual gifts. You need to be you because everyone else is taken. <laughs> Write that down. I need to be me because everyone else is taken. I've got natural abilities and I've got spiritual gifts and they're unique to me and they're gifts from the risen Christ, and they are determined by the will of God, and I submit to that. I'm going to be the best that I can be for God. wonder what your purpose is within the church? Well, today on Know the Truth, Philip DeCourcy explores the importance of discovering and using your spiritual gifts to serve others and contribute to the growth of the church. We're discovering different gifts and the roles they play in the body of Christ with the second part of a message titled, Something to Contribute. You can access the full message online at ktt.org. Right now, let's join Pastor Philip as he begins today's lesson. Let's take our Bibles and turn to Ephesians chapter 4, verses 7 through 16. The reason I'm sticking with Ephesians is because this passage you're in is a passage all about gifts. You know, Christ is the gift that keeps on giving. Follow along as I read Ephesians 4, verses 7 through 16, a message I called something to contribute. But to each one of us, that's each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, he says, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to man. Now this, he ascended. What does it mean? But that he also first descended into the lower parts of the earth. He who descended is also the one who ascended far above all the heavens, that he might fill all things." And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of man in the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. But speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ, from whom the whole body joined and knit together by which every joint supplies according to the effect of working by which every part does its share. Question, are you doing your share? By which every part does its share, causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. We read about Christ giving the church the tools necessary to finish the job which He started. See, He descended and gave Himself a ransom for many, and He set out to build a church, according to Matthew 16, 18. Then He ascended. And having ascended, He sent the Holy Spirit as a gift to the church, who then gave gifts to the church, tools to finish what Jesus started. That's where we're at. That means that you and I, under the Holy Spirit, are now the arms and legs of Jesus. We're His body, the mystical body of Christ. And Christ is building His church through the evangelism and discipleship of the church. Spiritual gifts, that's our subject. They're not toys to play with. They're not weapons to fight with. They are tools to build with. Your spiritual ability, your spiritual capacity, your spiritual gifting is not for your enjoyment or exaltation. It's for your employment and the mutual benefit of the church. Now, that's amazing. What Christ is going to do 
at this junction in history, He's going to do through you and me. He has ascended, and the Holy Spirit has descended. And He's inhabiting each one of us, and He's equipping us and gifting us to carry on what Jesus began to do and teach in the Gospels. Listen, there's no plan B. We're it. If the Great Commission is going to be fulfilled, if the kingdom of God is going to be advanced, if the glory of Jesus is going to be, you know, known among the nations, we're it. That's why your lack of involvement or your absence from the church is a vote to close its doors. God's work in the world centers on God's work in the church, where He puts each of us to work. And for the church to work, each of us must work the works that God ordained for us to do, Ephesians 2, verse 10. I was struck by this kind of dramatic image that Tony Evans employs in an interview he gave about his church in Dallas in the 700 Club. Here's what he said, everyone who joins our church must take a ministry. Stop. You can't join Oak Cliff Bible Fellowship in Dallas unless you sign up for a ministry. Everybody who joins our church must take a ministry. You cannot become a member if you don't agree to serve, because then you want to say, preach to me, pray for me, sing to me, but expect nothing from me. That's the existence of a leech. If you're going to benefit from the kingdom, then you've got to be a giver to the kingdom. That's what spiritual gifts are all about. That's what we're all about. That's pretty dramatic. The image of a leech on a body, sucking the blood out of that body. But Tony Evans sees non-involved Christians in the life of a church like leeches on the body of Christ. Dramatic, maybe even offensive, but real. So let's come back to this very, very important passage. That's why I've gone slow-mo on it last week, this week, next week. So vital, so important, because you're so vital and you're so important, you have something to contribute. So we, we looked at this passage under three headings, the distribution of the gifts, the description of the gifts, the design of the gifts. Now, I don't want to go back to where I was. Well, I want to pick up a little bit about the distribution of gifts. We said several things about spiritual gifts. I want to just reinforce this and kind of say a couple of things I didn't get to say. Number one, every Christian has sovereignly been given at least one gift. Some of us have more than one gift, one capacity, one ability, one enablement to serve the Lord in a way that's very effective. We read here, verse 7, but to each one of us grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. See him in 1 Corinthians 12, 7 to 11, 1 Peter 4, verse 10, which means that we're all indispensable. You can't do without me, and I can't do without you, and we can't do without each other. That's why when the church is called to gather, we need to gather. And when we gather, we need to serve. We need to contribute. We need to share. We're all indispensable. But that also means we're all different. We've all got different gifts. We've all got one gift at least, maybe more, one spiritual enablement that enhances the life of the church and builds the body. But we're all different. Some of us are hands, some of us are feet so to speak, from 1 Corinthians 12. So the implication is you need to be content with who you are and accept what you're not. God made you with certain abilities, didn't give you other abilities. You don't get to choose your gifting. That's chosen for you sovereignly and at the will of the Holy Spirit. And you need to accept that. You need to bloom where you're planted. You need to find the slot that God has designed for you to fill. Have you found that at Kindred? Have you discovered a while ago, whether in this church or another church, this is what God made me to do within the body, and I'm doing it. And I'm loving it because I was made for this. This is my slot, my lane. This is what I do best. And you don't look to the left or the right. You know? Listen. You need to be you, because everyone else is taken. <laughs> Write that down. I need to be me, because everyone else is taken. I've got natural abilities. 
and I've got spiritual gifts, and they're unique to me, and they're gifts from the risen Christ, and they are determined by the will of God, and I submit to that. I'm going to be the best that I can be for God. You need to be you for everyone else is taken. You need to be the best you you can be in Christ. Don't be a copy. Be an original. You're a child prodigy of the King of kings and Lord of lords. He's given you gifts unique to you. You're gifted. Be yourself in Christ. Number two, these gifts are the spoils of Christ's victory over sin, death, and hell. That's that whole thing about him descending to the lower parts of the earth in his death and burial and then his resurrection, ascending and giving gifts through the gift of the Holy Spirit. Number three, we were given these gifts at new birth. Number four, these gifts are communal in focus and not individual. Number five, and I want to come back to this, we need to make a priority of discovering these gifts. You've been given a gift. Have you unwrapped it? Do you understand where you fit best within the body life of a church? Now, we can serve the Lord outside our gifting, right? We've said this. Look, some have the gift of mercy. It doesn't mean you don't be merciful. Some have the gift of teaching. It doesn't mean that mothers don't school their children and fathers don't disciple their sons. But we are gifted to excel in a certain area for the mutual benefit of the body. And we need to discover that. That's a priority. And you know what's the wonderful thing? If we discover that as a priority, it sets the priority of our life. It's the wonderful thing about a spiritual gift. It sets the agenda for you. These abilities and capacities help us focus our time, passion, direction within life. Look, I don't know about you. One of the things that I think is challenging in life is to keep the first things the first things. There's a lot of things you and I could do, but there's only some things we must do, and there's a few things we really do well. And life's too short to be going around in circles, spinning your wheels. You need to put your life in gear and head in a direction that's God-ordained, and spiritual gifts will set that direction for you. They're wonderful that way. Last time we were together was we talked about you know, unpacking our spiritual gifts, we said that will require desire, discovery, and development. I'm going to add a fourth dedication. Let me go to Romans 12, verses 6 to 8, to kind of help you see what I'm talking about. Paul says this, having then gifts differing to the grace that is given, let us use them. If prophecy, let us prophesy in proportion to our faith. Or ministry, let us use it to our ministering. He who teaches in teaching, he who exhorts in exhortation, he who gives with liberality. I think I'm gifted in teaching. Don't answer that. I'm enjoying the thought of that. But that doesn't mean I don't do other things. But it does mean across a week, that's my focus. That's my priority. You know, nothing gets to take me away from that. Unless, you know, it's a clear, clear emergency. Because that's a priority. That's where I serve the Lord best. So that's the distribution. What about the description of the gifts? This is where we'll finish today and pick up the design of the gifts next time. In verses 11 to 12, we have a description of the gifts. And he himself, Christ, gave to some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry. It's very interesting, is it not, that the focus is on gifted people, not people with gifts. The gift in Ephesians 4 was gifted people, people with particular leadership skills for the benefit of the church. Now, there's a debate reading about, are we talking about five people or four I take it to be four. I'll make an argument for this. It's not a hell I'll die on, but I think you can make an argument grammatically that pastors and teachers can be read pastor teachers or teacher pastors. We'll come back to that. Here's the thing I want you to notice, but just the importance of, of leadership and the gift that leadership is to a church. Christ has looked at the church, he has determined its needs so that it might grow up in stature and edify itself in love, and he has determined its need of a body of 
men particularly, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers, that the church indeed may be equipped, encouraged, and indeed extended. It would remind me of 1 Thessalonians 5, 12 to 13, where we're told that the Christ on high, who has given us these men for the benefit of the church, would encourage us to esteem them highly from the Christ on high. Right? If you read that passage, it says, you know, to esteem those highly who are over you in the Lord for their work's sake. Man are God's method. The church is looking for better methods. God is looking for better men. And we have this here in Ephesians 4. Apostle Paul has talked about unity, the keeping of unity, the growing of the church. And he doesn't deal with methods so much as he deals with men, gifted men from the Christ who has ascended. Now, two things, the people involved and the purpose involved. Let's go through these different people that are described here. Number one, apostles. Frankly, we could spend a lot of time on this, but I'll just cut to the chase. I I think this is fundamentally dealing with the 12 disciples, and I would add into that the apostle Paul. These were men uniquely called and commissioned by Christ to be His direct representatives in the world. You can read about that in Mark 3, 13 to 14, Galatians 2, 7 to 8. Now, they were a unique body of men. I'll make an argument for that, number one, because they had each seen the risen Christ. It physically encountered the risen Christ, 1 Corinthians 9, 1, 1 Corinthians 7 to 9. That's one of the marks of an apostle. They had encountered the risen Christ. Paul was arrested, you know, stood up by Christ on the road to Damascus. Another thing was their ministry was distinguished by signs and wonders and miraculous powers that authenticated the messenger and they authenticated the message. You can read about that in 1 Corinthians 12, verse 12, and especially Hebrews 2, verses 1 to 4, which talks about how the apostles were attested by miracles and signs and wonders as they spoke for Christ. I limit this group to these men because they wrote the balance of the New Testament under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. So they are a unique body of men. I would argue, I think it's our church's position. I know it to be our church's position. They have no successors. See, we've got pastor teachers in our church. We've got deacons in our church. We have no apostles because there's no successors to apostles. They were a unique body of men. The gift and the office was temporary. In fact, we read in Ephesians 2.20 that they are in the foundation of the church. Having built the church on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Jesus Christ himself, the chief cornerstone. Number two, prophets. Are we talking about Old Testament prophets or New Testament prophets? Well, the context tells us this is a gift that Jesus has given post-resurrection, the one who ascended. So we're not dealing with Old Testament prophets, dealing with New Testament prophets. Who are they? Well, they were a body of people who became a conduit for the revealing of God's will to His people prior to the completion of the biblical canon. They were alive when Scripture was still being spoken and written. They provided comfort and counsel to the church, 1 Corinthians 14, verse 3. But like the apostles, I believe that office and that gift ceased. Because again, along with the apostles, we're told in Ephesians 2, 20, that they're in the foundation of the church, Christ being the cornerstone. And so I believe that apostles and prophets have been supplanted by the next two gifts, evangelists and teachers. See, the church no longer needs new revelation. That's why we don't need prophets. The canon has been complete. Inspired Scripture in itself is able to equip us onto every good work. So the church doesn't need prophets with new revelation. The church needs pastor teachers who take what has already been revealed and preach it because it's sufficient, it's authoritative. It covers all matters of faith and practice. I believe that apostles and prophets were temporary gifts, no longer in existence, and these gifts, along with some other gifts, ceased in the first century. That's why our church would be pegged as cessationist, 
Now, you'd have to qualify that. God is still miraculous. God can do miracles. But when it comes to certain gifts that mark the New Testament church, they are no longer normative. And certain offices and certain gifts are no longer in existence. They're in the foundation. The Scripture is complete. And the Holy Spirit takes the Word of God to create the church of God and instruct the people of God. Listen to Harry Ironside, a great old brethren writer. You do not lay a foundation for a building every few stories. You get that image? The apostles and the prophets are in the foundation. How many foundations does a building have? One. There's not a foundation on the first floor, and then a foundation on the second floor, and the third floor, and the fifth floor. And you know what? There's only one foundation, and it's not repeated throughout the stages of the church's history or growth. So the apostles and the prophets existed. They were wonderful gifts to the church, but now they're gone. Let me finish how Aaron says, quote, You do not lay a foundation for a building every few stories, but the foundation is built once for all, and then the superstructure is erected long ago, 1900 years ago, the apostles and prophets fulfilled their ministry, and we were no longer looking for new apostles or prophets. So, you know, when you turn TBN on, you got some prophet or apostle, turn the dial. Go and watch a sports game or something. It'll be more edifying. <laughs> Number three, evangelists. Evangelists. Now, everybody used to evangelize. Remember what I said last week? When we talk about spiritual gifts, it's not the only thing you do, right? So, you know, we're all to evangelize. We're all to be witnesses for Jesus Christ. Even pastors are called to do the work of an evangelist in 2 Timothy 4, verse 5. So everybody in the church is to be involved in the Great Commission. We are always to be ready to give a reason for the hope that lies within us. But some within the church really excel here. You're listening to Know the Truth with Philip DeCourcy in a challenging, encouraging message titled, Something to Contribute. To replay today's lesson, visit ktt.org. And Philip will be back in a moment, so be sure to stick around. Well, at Know the Truth, our goal is to encourage our listeners in their faith daily, equip them to serve in their local church and community, and engage them in sharing the gospel. And we do so by sharing God's Word through the radio and Internet, and also by sharing resources that help you grow in both knowledge and practical application of Scripture. This month, our featured resource is The Pilgrim's Regress, Guarding Against Backsliding and Apostasy in the Christian Life. In this book, author Mark Jones discusses the issue of backsliding believers and apostasy. This serious yet hopeful pastoral work is informed by wise theologians of the past and will equip you to guard against backsliding and apostasy in your own spiritual journey. You can request a copy of The Pilgrim's Regress for yourself or a loved one when you give a gift of any amount to know the truth. Just call 888-644-8811 or give online at ktt.org. Now, before we close, Philip has more he wants to share. I just want to take a quick moment to ensure you know how to stay connected with Know the Truth. Simply head over to our website, ktt.org. There you'll discover a treasure trove of inspiring resources, including my So True devotional, which offers bite-sized theology that speaks directly to your heart and mind and life context. Plus, you'll find links to our social media pages, making it easy for you to stay updated and all things know the truth and share the gospel message with friends, families, and neighbors. Don't forget, you can also access our content on the go by downloading the KTT app or podcast. Just go to your favorite app or podcast store and search for Know the Truth with Philip DeCourcy. Thank you, Philip. I'm Wayne Shepherd. Join us again tomorrow as we continue our study in the book of Ephesians. That's Thursday on Know the Truth. Today's program was produced and sponsored by Know the Truth Incorporated. Jesus said, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free.